Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey, for uh, sharing those insights. And we transition uh, from, you know, kind of uh, business prioritization a little bit more into some of the technology enablers. And uh, certainly all of the things that Jeffrey talked about and that we heard from Don and the team yesterday, there's tremendous pressure on digital transformation and modernization of our businesses and certainly in the face of uh, volatility, whether it be global pandemic, whether it be uh, geopolitical volatility, whatever, you know, these things seem to be happening faster. And the best way that we can all be successful is to have all of the information that we need available to us at the right time to make those decisions, especially in the transformation zone that, that Jeffrey talked about. And so uh, what I'm uh, hoping to do today with you in, in the time that we've got together it's really introduced to you this notion of smart data fabric and how that, uh, not a technology, but really a framework for how to think about data and uh, integrating data assets for the, the benefit of your business. And this is, this is not just like, um, uh, hey, I'm, I'm moving my data warehouse to the cloud or uh, any, any of those things. It really is a new way to think about how to integrate, manage, leverage, and get tremendous value from your, from your data assets. But I'm gonna start first with a personal story. Uh, and, uh, and I promise there's a point to all of this um, because I've actually experienced uh, uh, the need for a smart data fabric uh, myself. So uh, some people uh, are big baseball fans and they collect you know, baseball cards or they make annual trips to Cooperstown, you know, kind of to have a passion for the statistics and the data, uh, and, and that's their passion. Uh, sadly, uh, I don't have a hobby that's uh, quite as cool as that, but uh, I happen to collect old fountain pens. And so I guess that makes me a very analog person in a digital world. Uh, but my love of fountain pens, you know, started 36, 37 years ago, and you know, I started running around to antique shops and flea markets and you know, buying these pens, and I thought, wow, they're really, they're pretty, they're functional, uh, they're certainly the original data entry tool, uh, as it were. And, uh, and so you know, I started to uh, learn more and more about these pens. And then in 1987, uh, something happened that was very uh, instrumental in, in you know, my maturing as a collector, and that is I attended my first fountain pen show at the Days Inn in uh, Newark, New Jersey. And by the way, I've been speaking with the marketing folks about the Days Inn in uh, Newark, New Jersey, and they're thinking it might be a great place for Summit next year. So um, <laughs> it's inexpensive, uh, so, and it's easy to get to. Uh, but in any event, um, the thing that was interesting about this is that now I wasn't going to individual dealers and making transactions, but I had a whole bunch of folks with lots of inventory, folks who were informed about fountain pens and lots of selection, and a lot of dealers together so that I could actually learn a lot more, uh, a lot faster. And on that day, um, I bought my first you know, serious pen for uh, $225. It was really pretty, I'd never seen anything like it. It was very artfully put together. Uh, and, and, I, and it was a choice between that one, there was another one that was also very pretty, but it was $400, and I, well, I thought, well, I'll, I'll go with the one for uh, $225, and it was a great, uh, great learning experience. But then, after all of that, something happened in the 1990s with the advent of online auctions. And so now I wasn't relegated to an individual dealer or whatever dealers happened to be in the ballroom in uh, Newark, but pretty much everyone around the world with a shared interest. And it, it really changed uh, the way I approached the hobby and there was a lot more information because data really drives efficient markets. I was now able to connect with folks all over the world. I could actually understand how many of the things there were, how much they should be. I could start to get a lot of data points, how much it sold for here, how much it sold for there. I could de-risk my transactions because I had you know, known dealers and, and known items, and, and, and the pricing was really based on truly scarcity versus demand. And now, of course, that moves forward into uh, you know, th this decade with social networks and really kind of connecting people together and really bringing lots of different data and making for very effective 
markets. And so what really changed with all of this advent of technology is that we're able to really get real-time insights because we had data from lots of sources. And we could integrate that data, right? And it wasn't just um, factual transactional data and the price and the date or the description, but also photographs, provenance, and other kinds of, of data that we could get and assemble together to make much more effective decisions. And we could analyze that information based on both current and historical data and more importantly, uh, start to really predict where things were going. Does this, does this sound at all familiar? This is actually what we're doing in uh, technology today with a lot of our clients and we're hearing uh, demand in healthcare, financial services, supply chain and other vertical industries is, gee, we need to get real-time visibility from disparate data, data from different sources, data from different systems, data that is, has different types. Uh, we need to be able to integrate that quickly so that we can respond uh, very effectively to the competition in the marketplace. We can create better outcomes, we can manage our risk, we can manage our compliance and all of those kinds of things and do a much better job because we're now data driven. So I use the pen analogy um, and um, to kind of move into, you know, kind of the impact and technology and connecting data. But there's one difference between the pen analogy and how we operate our businesses. In the pen analogy, I, I became kind of an expert on all things pens. Okay, it's a little bit nerdy, but I am kind of an expert on all things pens. Great. In our businesses, because of the, you know, the number of connections we have, the number of touch points, the number of lines of business, every employee can't be as informed and sophisticated as a specialist would, would be. And so the implication behind that also is that we really need to be able to provide and build uh, easy interaction for applications that can consume and disseminate that information in a way that can be understood at any point in the business. And so the, the, the idea of being able to integrate all of this data but then transform that via application support so we can make everybody an expert and they have the advantage, right? So it's not just about data and connectivity, that's really, really important but then how do we go deliver that in a consumable fashion that drives value? And so this really is our vision for smart data fabric. So data fabrics and data meshes are something that's talked about in the industry today. It's a concept that really is driven by a lot of things that we're all experiencing in the marketplace uh, today. We've got lots of data. Uh, our data is no longer only living in our own data centers, but it's living in the cloud. There's third-party data. There's all kinds of different data that needs to be integrated. And so it's really driving this new notion and new architectural approach. And it's got a couple of key characteristics that make it smart. And we call it our smart data fabric because we're really trying to do a much better job than some of the, tr some of the um, traditional technologies by adding in that application layer so we can really deliver those insights in a consumable fashion. So the key characteristics, right, connectivity. You've gotta be able to connect the data. And this is a new concept, right? It's no longer about consolidating data into a data warehouse or into a data mart because it might be physically impossible and frankly, it will just take too long. So we need to be able to connect data at the source where it's created, whether it's in the device, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's third party data that we're consuming, whether it be in our internal systems, whether it's uh, on-prem, whether it's in one cloud or another, we'll be able to connect it and create that provenance so that, it's, uh, that it be can become trusted. And that ultimately is integration. Integration is more difficult than ever because Data has different formats and different standards, and you know there's a fire standard and an HL7 standard in uh, in healthcare. We may be getting uh, text documents from a news service from Bloomberg off of the web, and we want to disseminate that using AI to drive some sort of sentiment analysis, right? So integration, being multilingual in the platform, is extremely important, and you don't want to have to piece together different pieces of technology and manage that yourself. So connect it integrate it, and then make it self-service, all right? We talk about scalability a lot in the, in, uh, in the technology business, and scalability is hugely important, but I think self-service is kind of the next frontier 
of scalability because certainly we need to consume and manage large volumes of data. We need to be able to do it in, uh, in real time. Uh, we, have, we need to be able to linearly scale. But ultimately, it's that point of interaction where the value is created. So creating a self-service environment so that we can scale it out to the endpoints or to the edge uh, of our business is extremely important. More and more, we need to build in analytic content because the speed of decisions that are required and the sophistication of some of those decisions may be beyond uh, some of the folks in your business because, again, they may not be experts in everything in the full breadth and depth of, of what's going on. So being able to prepare some analytics to help them, whether it be um, um, yesterday we saw our, our rules editor uh, in, in the health share stack and being able to provide kind of a, a clue is like, yeah, if this happens, then, then do this, and, and help kind of automate those processes and do it with a level of sophistication that is not just rules-based, but also may include some other analytic content or machine learning algorithms to really enhance the sophistication of what we're able to deliver. And last but not least, multi-cloud portability. The cloud is obviously a huge enabler of this data explosion that we have, and those technologies and architectures that are being defined in the cloud environment today are driving ex uh, extremely high amounts of value, but they can also uh, drive uh, some issues in application deployment. So remember I said before that kind of that last mile of where you really get the payback from your smart data fabric is in being able to deliver applications. Well, if those applications are using a very specific uh, set of cloud-based tools, it may be very hard to move or have those applications be portable to a different cloud when you need to change. And so if you go into a new region, you have an acquisition, maybe a strategy change, and you want to change your cloud, you want to make sure that your applications are portable, regardless of what, uh, which cloud, which public cloud you've chosen, or on-prem, or any combination of the above. And it really gives you uh, that highest level of, of, uh, of agility. So the, these are the five key components that we talk about in, in when we're defining our smart data fabric strategy. And ultimately, it's really about driving value out of all of that data uh, at the end of the day. And being able to lower risk, have improved compliance, have better patient outcomes, reduce cost, uh, and have higher operational efficiencies uh, out there. So this is uh, all powered by InterSystems Iris, and this is really the bar that we set when we're thinking about um, how, uh, how we want to invest, how we want to build new features and functions and capabilities, is, is how do we expand our data platform to really make it the most sophisticated tool to enable a smart data fabric. This is not a new concept for us because you know, Iris at its beginning was really a design philosophy around having technology that enabled us to be interoperable, right? You need to connect and integrate data. About being resilient needs to be supportable. Um, it needs to uh, be capable. About being intuitive, being able to build applications in the native language that your application developers understand without having to learn anything new and being scalable, uh, being able to support the highest volume and the highest demands that are out there. And so this isn't a new thing for us in building the Iris Data Platform, but it certainly is an expanded set of capabilities that we're looking to deliver. And uh, the, the good news is if you're, if you're running uh, some of our uh, legacy products at Cache, it's never been easier to upgrade and migrate, and it's free to do it, to Iris and take advantage of all of these capabilities that we've built into our smart data fabric. So this is, uh, this is the landscape that we're building in. Uh, we're certainly far from done in how we're investing and how we're delivering. And at the conference, at, at, the, uh, at the breakout sessions this afternoon, you'll hear about the latest capabilities that we're uh, building into Iris to make it easier. I'll highlight a couple here that, uh, of interest, not that all of them aren't, uh, aren't interesting. But we launched recently our version of Embedded Python. And I mentioned uh, before uh, that application support, multilingual support is a really important thing for us in delivering the smart data fabric and being able to have true application portability. And we've actually now moved Python inside of the kernel of Iris, so it's now a first-class language. 
Uh, and uh, you can add that to the other languages that we speak that you can use to deploy and build decision-making applications for your companies. So you can now use uh, Python, and this is a true open version of Python with all the latest libraries. It also, the, uh, the implication there is most machine learning algorithms are written in Python as well. So you can have them run inside the kernel so you can bring the analytic to the data instead of bringing the data to the analytic. It's a much more efficient way to go process, gives you better, uh, better time, to, uh, time to value, as well as uh, overall better performance. I'm gonna talk a little bit more in a slide or two about our new cloud-based services, and we have a whole suite of services to make the technology easier to consume and more economical for you to consume, whether it be in the cloud or, uh, or on-premises. We've got a lot of innovation around uh, the fire standard, the, the rules editor, which you saw, saw yesterday. And then finally, we're, we're talking here in the tech exchange, we're launching uh, for developer preview, our columnar storage which for analytic kinds of uh, workloads can be very beneficial from a total storage and the total performance uh, aspect. So talk to some of our experts in the breakout sessions later or um, uh, in, in, uh, at, at our uh, tech center uh, to see if it might be something that's applicable for your use cases. Anybody hear about this thing called the cloud and it's kind of important out there? I don't see any hands. Anybody awake? There you go. So our smart data fabric needs to traverse all kinds of implementations, um, whether it be uh, you know, racks of servers that you've got on-prem or multiple different clouds. And there are different ways to deploy our technology in the cloud. And so we cover all of these horizons, anywhere from uh, running as infrastructure as a service where you're using cloud infrastructure instead of your own data center, to our own, um, to our own uh, managed services uh, in the cloud of your choice or on-prem, uh, where it's completely hands-off and we manage everything for you with, from Health Connect Cloud to InterSystems Iris and Iris for Health. And we've started building out a whole suite of SaaS offers that we think ultimately will be interesting and help you again uh, get things done without having to uh, make a lot of upfront investment, so quicker time to value. And so we have three new services that we're launching here at uh, Summit, as, uh, and they join the services that we, that we launched previously um, that are all based on Iris technology. And we talk a little bit about our strategy in offering uh, these um, uh, SaaS offers. We're actually going to do it in a bifurcated way. We're going to have a set of horizontal services that are useful for application developers, and uh, two of the services that we're launching here are those services, so Iris Cloud SQL Database and Iris Cloud Integrated Machine Learning. All right, so these are key capabilities that are a, a function of Iris that you can now spin up uh, as a pure SaaS model in the cloud and pay just based on the consumption of your applications. Uh, we'll be adding to that suite of horizontal uh, um, offers over time, things that we think uh, and that we hear demand uh, from our application development partners who want to go use those services. We'll also be building out some vertical stacks of uh, application widgets that we think are, are valuable and interesting in vertical industries. And so starting in healthcare, we've standardized around uh, the FHIR standard and the FHIR API with our uh, FHIR server which is very high performance, again, uh, on-demand, consumption-based kind of model. It uh, publishes and subscribes fire messages, um, and it's all compliant to the standard. We've also got our fire message transformation service. So if you've got HL7 messages, and coming soon we'll be supporting some other uh, message types coming in, and we'll, we will convert them into the fire standard and load them into um, the fire application server. And you saw a preview yesterday of our Fire SQL Builder. Once you've got data into the Fire uh, server and you want to do some analytics, you've got the Fire SQL Builder to kind of help create that roadmap and understand what data you've got access to and be able to build these workflows very quickly uh, and, again, on a consumption-based model. Uh, use them when you use them and when you don't need, when you don't need them, uh, you can spin them down. Uh, they're fully elastic uh, SaaS offers. And we'll look to build out more widgets in our app store for the fire vertical, and there'll be other verticals coming, uh, coming soon. So again, the idea here is to provide any touch point along the way to have our data fabric extend uh, across multiple different deployment models 
as well as multiple different consumption models. In the tech exchange, uh, hopefully, uh, if you haven't had a chance, I, I encourage you to come down to the tech exchange and you'll get to see all of the technologies that I talked about uh, that are key enablers for a smart data fabric. You'll also, um, if you come down later this afternoon, uh, we're gonna have um, a, an open mic session with myself and a couple of uh, colleagues from the development team at IRIS so you can kind of answer your questions and talk about any, pretty much anything that's on your mind. Um, and we look forward to that interaction. And we'll also be doing a preview of our smart data services vision. And smart data services is another consumption model on top of our smart data fabric. Uh, and show you some demos and some of the things that we're thinking about. And we'd love to interact with you and get your feedback uh, on, on those things that we're building uh, for the future of Iris Data Platform and, and our consumption model. We've got a very full day for, for the rest of the day with, uh, sur uh, with all of our breakout sessions this afternoon, anywhere from uh, education to uh, vision to real world examples. And we, we encourage and invite you to uh, take advantage of as many of those sessions as you can today. So before I uh, leave you, I want to go back to uh, my fountain pen uh, discussion. So that day in Newark, I told you that I had a selection of two pens, and this was the first time I had some connected data, a couple of dealers, and had seen, seen some things. So uh, this is the pen I bought, and I bought it for um, $225. Uh, and sadly, in 2022, it's still kind of worth about $225. Um, the $400 pen uh, sold in 2012 for $17,677. And um, so the lesson learned here is that you really need to have a smart data fabric to enable a decision uh, because if I had had that smart data fabric, I don't know, I could have saved about $17,200 on buying this pen. So, thank you very much. <laughs>